Uh, morning, everybody. Um, my name's Rod McElroy, as you just heard. Uh, I'm the managing director of Blue Jay. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, everyone in the room knows about Blue Jay, and unfortunately, sort of 15 minutes isn't necessarily enough time to uh, cover the more important points. But we're a, a, a company that's based in Greenland, and we've got uh, three projects in Greenland, uh, one in Finland. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time talking about three or four. But I guess before we get into points one and two, uh, I'd just sort of like to step back and just give a bit of a, a sort of a strategic overview of what the company really is and what it, what it represents to uh, potential investors and shareholders. We've been in Greenland for 15 years and um, one of the things that we recognised early on was that Greenland is a remarkable place. Uh, there's been more than 100 years worth of state-sponsored exploration going on in that country mostly by the Danes, um, they have mapped out and identified what are essentially all of their metal occurrences in that country, notwithstanding recent ice melt. And what we have done over that sort of uh, last 15 years is really take advantage of that information. So in a previous life, at a previous company, uh, I was the founding managing director of a company that identified the second largest occurrence of measured uranium in the world on the southern tip of Greenland. And that ore body came out of that database. And that process of going through that, uh, which ultimately led to Denmark overturning their 45-year ban on uranium exploitation on the back of our work and that project moving forward, meant that we, we met a lot of people in Greenland. We got to know everybody pretty well, as you could imagine going through a process like that. And when that, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, for, unfortunately, that, that project is now uh, owned by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. I'm um, going through the final parts of, of a mining license application. It's a big project that's plus one billion US to build it, but it will be one of the biggest uranium mines uh, in the world, along with some other coincident metals. Um, the regulators kind of, or certain parties within Greenland wanted us to stay, and they highlighted a project to us that um, was discovered in 1916. This is the Dundas Ilmenite project. Um, it was what was only sort of recognised, I guess, at that time as a very small, high-grade occurrence of Ilmenite. We went up there in 2014 after the sort of the transfer of control to the, uh, uh, to the Chinese group. And what we found was that through climate change and through this sort of receding ice uh, and snow, that what was originally thought to be a small localised occurrence was actually extremely prolific. And uh, over the course of uh, several years worth of work programs, um, we've got a resource there now, we've completed a PFS that will be out sort of in a high level fairly shortly. We've attracted one of the world's largest mining companies to this project, Western, um, it was announced again to market. Um, but again, what we, what we have is a dominant position in Greenland's mineral space and uh, those top three projects are, and actually uh, another project that we've recently licensed on the back of sort of maintaining this project pipeline, if you will, is um, without doubt the three best projects, four best projects in Greenland, notwithstanding the, the Kavanafeld deposit. And it's really maintaining that market dominance in this country that is extraordinarily well endowed of unexploited minerals. Uh, it's part of the EU in a sort, of a, a, a sort of a certain sense through Denmark, but again gives that certainty of uh, security, shall we say, which is a real issue in the mineral space. Board and management, um, we obviously, when you're sort of trying to bring a new frontier uh, jurisdiction to uh, the markets, you really need sort of the best names, I guess. Credibility is a big part of the overall process. Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Hutchinson, top left-hand corner, um, he was a chairman of the London Metals Exchange for uh, about 10 years. Ian Henderson probably needs no uh, introduction here. JP Morgan, natural resource fund manager. Uh, Hans Jensen, Greenlandic, um, Erpo, Finnish, and Peter War is our technical guy along with Bruno. But again, bringing the really the best names in the business to bear on this. PFS was completed for Dundas by uh, Wood, or which is formerly 
uh, AMAC Foster Wheeler, uh, Nairus Orbicon, IHC, uh, Netherlands Group, SRK, etc. And really, just to sort of really reinforce that, um, you know, make sure that we had a credible team of people because it's, it's sort of, it's outside the box, Greenland. A lot of people don't really have a high level of understanding of what the country represents or uh, what it's like to operate there or any of these sorts of issues. Um, so Dundas is really, I think, now at a point where it has been broadly defined. Um, we have a, a, a mining reserve of circa 70 million tons, 6.5% uh, ilmenite, 6.1% ilmenite. But we have, within the broader region, given that the licence holding here is 30 kilometres long, a couple of kilometres wide, and you know, varies with thickness, but uh, it's easy to point at maybe another, you know, anywhere between 300 and 700 million tonnes of uh, run of mine material for the purposes of the mining operation. Um, but in a broader sense, uh, the Danish Geological Survey, Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland uh, have identified in their previous studies, more recent studies, that up to 700 million tonnes of ilmenite could occur in the company's licences. So we're probably, I guess, getting to a point now where this project, because of its scale and its, its characteristics, is starting to pop up on, on larger players' radars. Uh, we have an agreement with Rio Tinto uh, Canada, which is their iron and titanium division, to deliver to them 5,000 tonne of this material for their smelting uh, facilities to test this in a batch sense. Um, the material at, at, at Dundas is actually unique globally, uh, and it comes, funnily enough, as, as a function of sort of this uh, uh, glacial environment that it was in. It's actually uh, closely related to what's called a fresh rock ilmenite, um, as opposed to these sort of placer beach type uh, deposits of ilmenite that have different chemical signatures. This material actually appears to be um, quite, uh, it's got a lot of synergy with what they're doing down in Quebec at the moment. So there's a little bit of interest there, a lot of work to do, but again, uh, just sort of identifying a track record here of pulling some pretty big companies uh, into uh, Greenland through our sort of dominant position. Uh, the rest of it is all, you know, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the location actually is probably an important one because not many people sort of see a map where they, they reference Greenland in relation to the Western Hemisphere or any hemisphere at all. And one of the things that um, opens a lot of people's eyes is sort of looking from the pole down and realising that Greenland actually is in an extraordinary position sitting between Europe, Western Europe and North America. And that is one of the important features with this project because of the access, the reach that this project has down into Quebec. Uh, with this larger mining group. Uh, supportive government, I mean, th this is a country that's uh, EEC, uh, very mining friendly, uh, put in place a new mining act in 2009 when the Denmark, when I mean, the Danish Crown transferred to the people of Greenland the mineral and hydrocarbon rights for the entire country of Greenland. So that went to 50,000 people. Um, the licence there, uh, you can see that there's a couple of different project areas. That 60, 70 million tonne of, of measured uh, just comes from the Murasak up the left hand side. That's the Murasak raised beach. There's several other project locations here that, that will add additional uh, resources as things move forward. The Italac Delta is uh, the main feeder zone for that sort of glacial erosion material that then is spread on what is quite an extensive marine terrace. It's unusual, actually, you don't find marine terraces. Greenland doesn't tend to be a place that's horizontal. Uh, it tends to be quite a vertical topography, so we're kind of fortunate there as well. Uh, Idlac East, which is down here, uh, but more importantly is sort of this, what's called this sort of offshore shallow marine area. Now that's where the largest volume of this material sits. Um, out in that environment, you, you do get patches of this that sort of 50, 60, 70 percent ilmenite because it's quite an active environment. Uh, it ranges from zero sea level, let's say, 
out to a water column depth of about 20 metres and 30 kilometres long and it can be up to sort of 50, 60 metres thick out there. So it's a huge volume of material and this is really why we're popping up on the radar of the major players in the space. Uh, disco. Now this is, this is actually, funnily enough, sort of getting close to time, but this is a geological model you don't see very far, uh, very often within the mineral space. Um, this is what's called a flood basalt. It's a magmatic massive sulphide. So there's a certain type of basalt, if you like, that when continents rift apart, which happened between Canada and Greenland X number of years ago, you, you get upwelling of, of material that comes from close to the centre of the earth and it's very metal rich and it sort of intrudes into what is in this particular instance uh, a very sulphide rich, sulphur rich uh, basin and there are occurrences all through our licence holdings here of some extraordinary nickel and copper uh, outcrops. The most significant one I think of which another again and this comes back to this project wasn't discovered by us this was actually discovered in 1892 from memory by uh, some gentlemen who discovered a 28 ton boulder of what is essentially 10 percent uh, nickel copper and then platinum uh, cobalt credits in there that had essentially rolled down the mountain and was sort of sitting on the shoreline and um, that sort of boulder retracing identified a sort of an intrusive part of this sequence that was very, very rich in, in these metals. This is the first time these projects have actually fallen down to a junior. Prior to this, they were all owned by majors, um, the most recent of which was Cairn Energy, who I'm not sure whether you remember, but they were quite active on the west coast of Greenland looking for oil. And uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, they were also looking for minerals in Greenland. And they had this. but. Uh, through a series of fortunate events, we were able to secure it, and uh, we've been working on this. Now, what's interesting with this project, we, we have what is a ridiculously large license holding, because this, this entire geological feature, if you like, is many, many thousands of square kilometres. It's, it's similar to the Siberian flood basalts, which house a particular type of deposit called the Rilsk. But um, what's happened recently is the we, we've expanded the licences to sort of cover, I think, the most critical parts of it. But more recently, there's been two um, licences that have been dropped in and around us that one 7,500 square kilometres by one of the largest top five mining companies to the north. And then more recently, uh, to the south, another couple of thousand square kilometre licence lodged by another mining company that's also quite large to the south. So, again, it's a validation of, of the model that we've been uh, pushing in Greenland. You're going to see more about DISCO moving forward because Dundas will now sort of, I guess, to a certain extent, enter a process that is defined by other parties. Um, our work will now focus on DISCO moving forward. So, you know, that I think is something that we're quite excited about. Uh, certainly the best thing I've seen in Greenland and one of the best things I've sort of seen around full stop. Uh, big work program there this year. We will sort of see um, a lot more coming out on that in the future. Uh, kind of out of time, but, um, you know, in terms of an investment case, uh, I think I've sort of covered most of it. We know what we're doing in Greenland. We sort of made our mistakes. I think one of the key themes that... that Sort of my colleague and I have been sort of talking about earlier in the booth is that going back um, six months, 12 months ago when we sort of had anticipated certain things falling into place with Rio back in 2018, uh, the value of the company was significantly higher than where it is now. And um, what we have in place is uh, we've completed the environmental, social uh, impact assessments. We've lodged those with the government for Dundas. We've completed the PFS. That's been lodged. The mining licence should be lodged August. We expect that that um, smelter test that we're doing there will be concluded sort of Q1 next year along with the approval of the mining licence for Dundas. And um, all of these things that we have now, we didn't actually have before when the value of the company was much higher. Um, at some point, there will be an event that will drive 
I believe, the share price higher, and it will come as a function of that smelter test. So that's still quite some months away, so what happens between then and now, but um, obviously we've got a few things to keep us busy in between uh, then and where we are today. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.